Hello, and welcome to Baha'i Blogcast, with me, your host, Rain Wilson. This is where I interview members of the Baha'i faith and other friends from all over the world about their hearts and minds and souls, their spiritual journeys, what they're interested in, and what makes them tick. Enjoy. Hello there, Baha'i Blogcast. I am speaking to a very special guest in Hong Kong. So thrilled to have Khalil Fong on the line with me. Hi, Khalil. Hi, Rain. It's great to uh, finally speak to you and, and, and to meet you over Skype. Yes, we've... Can, uh, we, can we say Skype? <laughs> we could say Skype, yes. We're, <laughs> I hope they don't sue us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, so uh, for the listeners who may not know, uh, Khalil Fong is a huge recording artist in Hong Kong. And he has millions and millions of fans and has done how many albums now? Like six, nine albums, something like that? It should be nine recording. Yeah, nine, nine recording albums. Uh, studio albums. Nine studio albums, yeah. Nine albums yeah. over a, about the last 12 years that he's been professionally recording and performing in, in, in Hong Kong. And as a devout Baha'i, um, and really excited to, to talk to you. I've, I've never spoken to an international pop soul star before well i'm excited too it's it's, it's great to it's great to converse with you now, in China, they don't know you as Khalil Fong. You have a Chinese name, and, and what does your Chinese name mean? My Chinese name is uh, Fang Da Tong, which means, well, Fong is my surname. Uh, it means square. <laughs> but um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but uh, actually, um, Da Tong means oneness. And um, the original, the early name um, in Chinese that people adapted for the Baha'i faith was actually Da Tong Jiao which is the religion of oneness. Oh, uh, that's beautiful. They, yeah, yeah, until they changed it to actually, you know, the, the uh, Baha'i, which sounds uh, phonetically like, like uh, the, you know, Baha'i faith. So uh, back then it was my grandfather who, uh, he wasn't a Baha'i, but he told my parents, he said, well, why don't you just call him Fang Da Tong? You know, the meaning is, is great and it's easy to, it's very easy to write. It's very, the characters are very simple. Some probably the three of the simplest characters in uh, Chinese language. So, you know, it was a win-win situation. So you're oneness square. Can I call you oneness square? Oneness square. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Square <laughs> or, or if you it's it's oneness square or if you want to break it down in three characters, it's a square big same. <laughs> square big same. There you go. There you go. <laughs> So how did how did this all happen? I love the international multicultural aspect of who you are. You were born in Hawaii, then moved to Hong Kong, where they speak Cantonese, but you record in Mandarin, and then recently you've also recorded some in Mongolian as well. I understand, but tell yeah. me about this your international story. Well, uh, as you said, I was I was born in Hawaii. Um, and, uh, after that, when I was uh, five or six, um, you know, naturally my, my parents wanted, well, especially my father, um, he was quite adamant that we should move to China. Um, they, they also wanted me to learn Mandarin and, you know, they didn't want me to really turn out, uh, to, well, you know, American born Chinese were, uh, I only speak English and, and, you know, get disconnected from the culture. So, we went to Shanghai. That was, I think, 1990, 1989 or so. And, okay. um, yeah, they put me straight into uh, primary school. And, and, you know, I had no idea of the language. So I was, I was stuck in uh, primary school and it took about three or four months to start understanding a bit of Mandarin. And so, you know, from that, that experience, I, I really um, got, you know, I'd say a good exposure to, to Chinese culture. And, and so... We lived in Shanghai for about six years, and then you know a very short uh, stint in Guangzhou, and then then uh, we landed in Hong Kong um, when I was about eleven or so. Mm -hmm. and we've been here ever since, and it's been I think more than thirteen years. 
probably 14, yeah, probably 14 or 15 years now in Hong Kong. Okay. And when did you start making music? How old were you? Well, I was, uh, I think ever since my father's, my father's a drummer, so he said he would, uh, he would drum on my mom's belly when, when I was still <laughs> yeah, in, the, in the womb. So, I mean, I guess I, I was exposed to beats and, and rhythm at a young age. But when I, you know, uh, I think when I was three, I already started listening to a lot of uh, the records my dad listened to. So it would be, you know, jazz, funk, um, blues, ex- you know, all, all the good stuff. Miles Davis, um, Stevie Wonder, the one of our Steely Dan. Um, and I, but I think what really did it for me was... Uh, besides the influence of my, you know, father's musical taste, was when I watched La Bamba. I saw La Bamba when I was, uh, I think, four or five. Could could even be three and a half, actually. Yeah, three and a half, now I think of it. And I, I probably didn't understand every single thing that was going on in the film, probably maybe 60, 60%, 70%. But that film really moved me. And, and ever since that film, I think that's what really catapulted, that gave me that sort of, it planted the seed of, of you know, I have to I have to sing, you know, I have, somehow I have to be associated with the with the stage with music. Yeah, I don't so, remember much about La Bamba, but the enormous struggle he was up against to kind of become a singer, and all the obstacles that he had, and and the amazing triumph that he had um, yeah. overcoming them. Yeah, it, and that spoke to you it, as a five year old. Yeah, yeah, and the music was great, and the story was. I mean, it was a touching story, and it was sad because the, you know the. That day, uh, there, there's a day that they call uh, the day that rock and roll died, which is the day that Richie Valens, Buddy Holly, and uh, I think Big Bopper, they all they all passed away in a plane crash. Right. And, yeah, it was it was a. Uh, I, I think as three and a half, three and a half, seeing that, you know, with all the the music, the the, the drama, and, and sort of this loss, it was quite quite an impact. It's funny, like for me, I uh, I, I tell the story about there's a, a really terrible. Um, movie version of the musical A Chorus Line that came out. In fact, it's considered one of the the worst movies of the 1980s. But that was the movie that made me want to become an actor, even though it was terrible. I'm not saying La Bamba was terrible. La Bamba was a pretty good movie. But it was. it's kind of an obscure movie. It's not a lot of people reference La Bamba as something that changes the course of their life. Um, but I watched um, A Chorus Line in trying to decide whether or not to become an actor in the mid-1980s, you know, and it was all these singers and dancers crying about, you know, I really need this job, and, you know, should I become an actor, and singing and dancing, and I had tears pouring down my face, and, and I walked outside of the movie theater, and it was snowing in Boston, and the sun was setting, and, and I had this kind of mystical experience. It's like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to become an actor. And it was really because of this really terrible movie. And I knew it was terrible when I was watching it. I was older than you. I was like 19, 20. Um, but it, I was profoundly moved, and it, it changed the course of my life. That's, that's, I haven't seen it. I should go and check that out. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> it really, is, it really uh, is awful. Yeah. But actually, you, that you just, uh, while we were on La Bamba, it reminded me, you've, saw, you've seen Ray, right? Mm-hmm. With Jamie Mm-hmm. That the same producer, I, I forgot it was producer or director, but basically the same group of people uh, did Ray, who did La Bamba. They wanted to do Ray in the 80s when they did La Bamba. But at ah. the time, yeah, no one would fund the film about a soul singer. And, and so it took him, you know, years of patience and perseverance to get to where he could actually shoot Ray. It's really interesting when I found that out. Taylor Hackford directed uh, Ray. Um... Luis Valdez directed. Must be the same producers. Same um, producer, yeah. Yeah, interesting. And so you have a just a great love of American music, American soul music, African American music. Um, how does, what is that? I have so many questions for you. And I find uh, it just so fascinating what you do and, and what you've achieved. But how do you take your love of, Rock and roll and soul and R and B and funk and now rap too. I've heard you doing some rap stuff. How do you put that into China? How, how does China react to you doing that music? How do you, how do you bridge those two cultures musically? Well, it's for me. I mean, I guess I grew up with a very eclectic 
taste in music. So it's it's I'm it's almost as if I'm like a jack of all trades and an expert at none kind of thing. But it works well in the sense that my initial entrance into this, the music scene here was really about trying to introduce the genre of soul music into uh, the Chinese industry because it was a very much untapped or a very foreign style. Um, and it still is very niche here actually, but it's taken you know a good 11 years to actually, uh, I'd say I, I'd be one of the people who have contributed to the knowledge of, of soul music, the jazz and blues in, in this part of the world. From being sort of, you know, a big fan in this music genre um, and trying to do it in Chinese, it, I've sort of come to a point right now where I'm trying to blend the two cultures, blend, um, you know, uh, certain traditional uh, Chinese elements, the Western music. So right now it's sort of, I'm in, I'm in the mentality of really bridging, trying to bridge the gap. And I think it's about, you know, having diversity in music. And I'm really hoping to show, I guess, the Baha'i spirit within how I approach music, which is very diverse and eclectic, almost like a, a, a no rules sort of thing. So, right. so as you mentioned recently, I did a, a collaboration with a Mongolian man. And it was a, basically a, tri, a, a, a bilingual, was it trilingual? Trilingual, because the song had a uh, Mandarin uh, chorus, which I sang. The verse was Mongolian, and there was a bridge in English. So I, I'm trying to tap into this. Uh, I really hope that I can encourage the idea of having trilingual, biling, you know, bilingual, trilingual, whatever amount of languages you want in a song. Because hopefully in the future, you know, you know, just have songs in particular languages. You know, I, right. I, I look forward to yeah. Yeah, it should be right. Fun, it's so. true. It's true world music that you're doing. Oh. So <laughs> I, I know nothing about the world of China. I've never been over there. What is the what is music different in Hong Kong and in Cantonese than in mainland China? And right. I, I am sure, just like there are here, there are many different styles of music as well. It's not like there's just Chinese music or Chinese pop music. But uh, can you just give a, a little thumbnail sketch of what that's like? So yeah, in Hong Kong and mainland China, I'd say that. Uh, they have definitely stuck to a very formulaic genre within the past 20 years or so. Um, and, and kind of, have, I think it, it sort of, um, they, they've gotten less receptive to what's going on musically with the rest of the world, I think. And even my mom, uh, in her generation, you know, she was from Hong Kong, but they would listen to lots of music, all kinds of music. And she, she said it wasn't, how it is, you know, uh, currently. So I've noticed in the last 11 years that um, a lot of, you know, younger people will will not be too open or, or uh, too interested in listening to music, with, you know, in, in other languages. Um, and so for me, it's like, oh, you're missing out on a lot of stuff. You're mm. missing, you know, on, on the emotion of music. It's not just about, um, I, I can appreciate, understand that you'd want to listen to, you know, a, a music in your own language to understand you know, lyrics, but... There's also something, you know, immensely wonderful about listening to the emotion, even in a, you know, of a Latin, Spanish song, uh, Portuguese, you know, uh, Carlos Jobim, you know, all that stuff. So, so I guess for me, it's always been a, in my interviews. I'm always talking about and introducing music that I love, and, and it's always a very eclectic bunch of uh, music. And, and I think what's good is that in the last three years or so, three or four years. I've found that things are changing with how social media and how the internet is. I, I think, you know, the youth are really reaching out and actually, you know, finding things that they like themselves and, and, and really uh, starting to see more of what's available out there. So I feel that that's changing and that's evolving. Is K-pop big? That's very big. That's very big. That's, that's uh, gotten big. But I isn't K-pop the... also kind of based on some R&B stuff? Yeah, uh, the thing about no, it's it like is like in like in sync or boys to men or you know some right. of that stuff or new it's, kids on the block kind of feel. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's big in the sense that it's trendy. You know, I, I mean, I personally listen to K-pop as well, but it's considered like a trendy pop icon, mm -hmm. I guess you could say in that sense. So, and it's very good production value, and and the stuff is uh, a lot of it is actually pretty unique in, in its own right. So. That is popular, but I think it's still the idea of there, there's 
there's lacking that diversity, which I, which is very important to me in music so, as well. So you're a pioneer, really, of trying to open up people's minds and their ears to new ways of listening to music and new uh, ideas in music. So you're kind of breaking down walls in a lot of ways with your with your music, and at the same time, you're really upheld by the Chinese government and the press uh, for your clean living and your image of being, um, you know, having a lot of integrity. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I know you don't want to sing. You're a very humble person. You don't want to sing your own praises, but I think when when uh, you know Baha'is or no, non Baha'is, wh whoever it be, whoever tries to I think accomplish something or tries to create something based upon very positive and and good morals and principles. I mean, I think that's very hard for. Uh, it's very hard not to agree with something like that. So. It's really more so about, you know, recognizing sort of the principles that I try to adhere by or, or try to put forth in my in my work or in my art. Um, and I think that's that's a universal thing, and, mm -hmm. and it's the same for for every place. So, um, and I, I think at this time in China and within the last ten years, they've they've really focused on um, education and even. Moral education, in fact, even the, the principles. They, they, of course, they, they'd probably uh, name it differently in, in the way they'd explain. It, but it's very much, you know, I'd say based upon philosophies, very similar and ideas, very similar to uh, Baha'i beliefs. So they're definitely seeing, you know, this importance of educating the, the new generation, um, especially with such a fast-growing country. That's fascinating. Um, I think there's in the West there's a lot of misconceptions about China. And can you address that? What would you like uh, listeners? I mean, a lot of people listen to this. Actually, yeah. <laughs> only 37 people listen to this podcast, but most of them are in the U.S., a few in Australia, New Zealand, and some in England, um, uh, a few other points in the world. But what would you like people to know about mainland China that uh, they may have a misconception about? Well, I'd say there's... Uh... I mean, yeah, definitely. That there's a big misconception. Um, uh, even you know, a lot of uh, foreigners who, who I've known within the years who've gone to to mainland China, and they've been quite surprised too. You know, they, they thought that it was uh, um, tanks and barbed wire, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that was back in the in the you know like two two thousand or, or late nineties or something. But I mean, that's what they thought back then, even. But it wasn't so at that time. Um, but uh, I'd say if you look at it, Hong Kong, Hong Kong is Pretty much like you'd say, uh, you know, New York. If you're talking about mainland China, it's you know, it's very, uh, well, it's very large. So city to city can really differ very much. But I would say that you know, with the time that they've had to, to grow from uh, the early '80s till now, they have really um, grown and, and evolved at such a fast pace. So you, you know, in the Baha'i faith, when it says China is the country of the future, you can really identify with that and, and see that when you're there because um, it's it's quite impressive I'd say it's it's not easy too for a population uh, of such to to actually go through this process mm. Um, so, mm. so I would say yeah I'd say a lot of things when you're you know uh, perspective is a, is a very big thing I think the one big thing I've learned from moving around so many places is that you see both sides and you see how other people perceive each angle and and you really understand how people misunderstand a lot of things mm. you know it's really just like if you look at it if you look at cultures and countries even from the perspective of a household um you know each household just has different uh sort of dynamics um and different ways of communication mm -hmm. and a lot of times they're all about the same things they're universal you know fundamental things just slightly you know different in in, in um context or i don't know how, how you say it but um if you look at it in that sense actually it's quite it's quite easy to to understand i think a lot of the misunderstandings or misconceptions um, that we have about different cultures and, and how you know different peoples across the world work so mm. yeah i'd say uh go to china and check it out because there there is even recently i went to a, a city uh chengdu which i hadn't gone to for at least six years and when I went there, I was like, "Wow, this is this is totally different from what it was six years ago." It now looks like a very futuristic city. Um, wow! 
it has amazing, uh, you know, avant-garde architecture. Um, it, it has, you know, buildings with, uh, with, with greenery. Mm -hmm. um, and it, yeah, it's very modern. I was like, wow, this is, you know, if, imagine if this was multiplied, you know, how many times throughout China. But of course, because it's so big and, and every province, every city uh, is, is kind of developing at, at different paces. I mean, it will take some time, but, but you, you know, it's quite, it's quite interesting. It's wow, interesting. that's fascinating because you go to so many American cities and it's the opposite. You know, you, you were there, oh, I was here 10 years ago and oh, wow, this city's way more dilapidated than it oh. used to be. I mean, not all of them. There's a lot of cities that are experiencing huge growth in a lot of different ways, but um, uh, it is the land of the future. And plus the, you know, China taking the, the lead in environmental stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and renewable energy and green architecture and um, solar and wind and, and stuff like that. I'm really glad that uh, China's taking the lead on that stuff. Um, so what are your songs about, mostly? Is there, is there a way to ask that question? Is that a fair question to ask? Um, I was really struck in listening to them by just a wide range of styles that you use. So obviously they can't all be about one thing, but if, is there a theme that runs through your music? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I write, I write, of course, lots of love songs, like a lot of people do. Um, yet, of course, I don't only write love songs. I try to write. Uh, I guess I, I do have a percentage of material that is about social issues. You know, I mean, I, I don't try to be. Well, I try not to be preachy when I write. I prefer to write from a, a more. Uh, how would you say? Uh, an another a different place than the preachy place. So mm -hmm. um, I say, yeah, I, I, I write, uh, I've written, you know, I think one interesting, actually one uh, song I've written once in, uh, it was the album This Love. Yeah, I wrote a song, um, a friend of mine had told me a story of a, of a close friend of theirs who had committed suicide. And so I had, I was very saddened by that. I didn't know that friend, but I was very saddened by that because she was, she was a very young, very young lady. And um, I felt that if I could write a song to at least function as, as something that may deter someone from taking their own life, you know, that, that would be, uh, as, you know, at least a service, some sort of service to humanity in some ways. So I, I did that, and um, this is something that I, you know, occasionally do happen to repeat in, in interviews, but um, the thing about that song was, uh, when you're a songwriter, creator, you think that, you know, I'm going to write this song, and like, it's really, is it really going to help, you know, is it really going to help, because it's a song, people just kind of, you know, listen to songs, and and it's done so sure uh I, I yeah i was i always wondered and years later i think it was about four years later uh we received fan mail and one of the fans uh, i'm not sure when she became a fan but uh, the fans uh, basically said that she had been going through our time and was seriously considering uh, taking her own life and that was a song that really deterred her and, and made her change her mind um, and mm. so that, that that letter was quite something. That's when I I realized I made the connection that yes, we do, what we do really does have an effect, mm. uh, and 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 the import and the importance of ideas, and the uh, initiatives or the, the 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 heart behind what what we do with our art is is very important. So and how does the Baha'i faith affect your music or influence inspire your music? I think everything I write. Uh, sort of stems from the basis of, of you know, Baha'i faith, Baha'i teachings and principles. And, you know, a lot of it is, is very much based upon, you know, the, the unity and diversity aspect. Um, I think about um, uh, society, uh, besides the love song. Well, you know, love songs, you know, society has love too, so it's a bit of everything. But I think, I'd say my music tries to really have a, a basis 
and 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 to s- support this this sort of world this inclusive world view mm-hmm. um, and i think yeah i think that does reflect itself uh, a lot in, in what i do and now your parents are baha'is you you grew up baha'i but is there a moment for yourself as an adult because we obviously as baha'is we don't just inherit the faith of our of our parents and we we're taught the indiv- individual investigation of truth was there a point for you that your faith became really strong that you made a, a conscious choice of this is my this is my faith and this is what i believe this is why and and that your heart took a step towards commitment in your faith uh well i think it's to a certain extent, it's always, well, I wouldn't say it's always. I mean, I, I'm sure, you know, so many different people in the world. But I'd say being generally being raised in a Baha'i family, I think there's certain things um, that come easier, come more naturally in, in that sense. Um, I mean, I heard I heard the uh, interview with, with Andy. And, in a, you know, in a sense, that's all, that was also, I think, where he was coming from in the sense that he was born into a Baha'i family. So a lot of things were very, very natural to him. And for for me, um, I think it was very much a similar way. I mean, I am naturally a more, uh, I would say, uh, in nature, a, a, a very logical type of person. So I mean, there's always the logical side of me that says, you know, there's, you know, science and religion and whatnot, and and, and mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. uh, and, and it's, you know, there's the skeptical side of me naturally, and and I think, um, you know, that also is 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 within. Uh, I think the independent investigation of truth and everything. But for me, I think this is really, at the end of the day, to me, uh, a belief and a religion that, that makes sense to me as a person and, and how this world is sort of put together. I mean, mm-hmm. really, mm-hmm. I'd say, yeah. Doesn't Abdul Baha say, and I, I don't know the exact quote, that faith is conscious knowledge? And then that knowledge put into action. So that's really what you're talking about, that you have these uh, deep set beliefs and the ideas behind the Baha'i faith, and then you're putting those into action in your music. Yes, yeah, you, could, you, yes you could say it basically like that. Have you ever had any kind of uh, mystical spiritual experience, something that more touched your heart? I think, yeah, for me, it's always, I think because, I, because I'm more, uh, my nature is more, in, in a logical sense, I've always felt that the Baha'i faith has has really appealed to me in its very scientific approach to things, and it's very, um, I, I'd say, the the logic aspect as well. And, and you know, things in the in the Baha'i faith very, makes makes sense very much, especially in this day and age. And um, and I think that the, there are a lot of very practical things mm-hmm. and practical teachings, and, and and these things to me are really What's so whether it be you know uh, Baha'is, but even my friends who aren't Baha'is, you know they love and recognize these teachings and, and, and these principles, and they and feel that yeah, you know this is this is the time for for such teachings. Right, right. Yeah. And what's what are you working on in your life right now spiritually? Do you have what are your spiritual tests? What a, what are what are your struggles? I ask every person what they're what they're dealing with. I think it's uh, good for the listeners to relate to. What is an international Chinese pop and R&B mm-hmm. star struggle with? Well, let me think. Well, I've just, well, I don't know if this would be a spiritual struggle so much as a practical struggle. Uh, would, would, but you mean, you're, you're really talking about more spiritual struggles. Uh, yeah. That, yeah. That sense, right? I yeah. Think. Um, well, I'd say, I mean, I think spiritual struggle, I'm sure, is, it's ongoing to me. I think it's always about, um, you know, what's that quote? You're the, uh, you're the summoned to a reckoning. Um, how, how does the beginning of that quote go? Um, bring thyself to account each bring day. Bring thyself to account each day. You're the, yeah. Ere thou art summoned to a reckoning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, that always was a quote that's, you know, that, that I, that really rang true with me a lot because it would, it's so... I think in this day and age, it's very important that that every day or every moment, it's almost of seeing ourselves from a, from an outside perspective and and sort of uh, self monitoring in that sense. Ah. And I think that yeah, I think that is 
you know, something that, that goes on every day. It's like, oh, when we talk of bat biting or gossip, it's like, oh, you know, I think in a modern world uh, and, with you know, working with so many people, it, it's something that is that is constant and, you know, it, 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 the possibilities or the fact that it does happen or possibilities that it will happen are always around. So it's always, I think I try to always encourage whether it be for myself or, or with, with the people around, I try to, I'd say, use the bi principles in, in, in addressing, you know, everyday work issues within, within the, you know, office or within, within the workplace, basically. Well, so, it, so that I, reminds yeah. me of the, the Ruhi Book 5 and working with youth and the introduction. It was really revelatory for me when it talked about the twofold moral purpose and that we have our one purpose to make ourselves better people and then we have that other mm. purpose to try and make the world a better place and that both of these things need to work in tandem and um i kind of hear that coming through in what you're saying yeah it's it's very interesting because some, something that's always in my mind is that when you're a public figure um to me you know some people may not may not care as much but for me it's always you know, I, I really want to try my best to make it a point to practice what I preach. Mm. Um, it's not going to happen 24-7 because we're all humans and we're imperfect. But that is something that is always sort of that goal that is in my subconscious. And I think that is really what sort of keeps me grounded, I think, um, in everything I do. Um, and it's, it's really sort of the... Uh, aspect i think that it that keeps me in the right direction or keeps me you know keeps me mm. positive keeps mm -hmm. me, yeah that's great take that so seriously you're also really into healthy food and healthy living is that something that you've had to work hard to do what's your philosophy behind that well that's that i think comes from my dad because my dad was the first vegetarian in the family and my mom became a vegetarian after that soon after and I was born into the family of vegetarians so uh, that that was very much inherited um, uh -huh. but uh, I'd say definitely after you know d doing research and, and studying and reading about it that you do see that there's the whole uh, environmental aspect as you say and, and it's uh, not only in the Baha'i faith it also says that the, f the future diet will be very much based upon a veg vegetarian diet mm -hmm. uh, and so I, you know, you can see that from the scientific proofs um, that we, you know, read about in. in yeah, CDs. it's it's so, unsustainable for a billion people to be eating beef every day. It yeah. uh, would be devastating to to the planet. Exactly. Although I would I would hate to give it up, but <laughs> I I need to I need to think about that. Thank you. You've gotten me, you've gotten me uh, thinking. So what's next for you? I read something online that you released a double album last year that mm -hmm. it looks uh, looked really amazing. Um, uh, it was a very ambitious album, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that album and then where you're going artistically afterwards. Well, uh, that album was my uh, uh, celebration, I guess you could say, with my fans for being my uh, 11th year, well, by then 12th year, I guess, in the industry. And so... I wanted to do a double album, um, to, and and it was going to be, I'd say it's my last physical album, like actual printed physical album, because nobody's you know listening to CDs these days; it's all yeah. digital. So it was uh, you know a pretty big thing for me, and and it was uh, the first album under my own independent label. So I just started a label uh, within the last two years, and it's called Foo Music, um, and Foo Foo means ode, so it's an ode to music. Mm. And uh, I'd say this, besides, you know, we were just talking about spiritual challenges. This is a, uh, you could say, a, a material challenge in the sense that it's it's really pretty challenging to set up your own label. Mm. Uh, although it is a passion, it's a passion project. Um, can but, I know, can I record on your label? Oh, sure. <clears throat> uh, what do you want to sing? Songs from the uh, that film? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you you don't want it. Yeah, from a chorus line. <laughs> yes, <laughs> my personal uh, one person version of a chorus line. No, you don't want to hear me sing. Trust me. Trust me. All right. Well, we yeah we could uh, yeah we could. <laughs> but are you gonna have other artists on your label, or is it your yeah, label mostly yeah. for yourself? We will actually. I've signed uh, two, and our first artist will come out this year. Um, and that's for me. It's it's actually it's kind of a sacrifice in a way i don't want to say sacrifice because it sounds like you know uh, it, 
it sounds too, you know, too great a thing. But for me, I think I went into this double album knowing that after I did this, I'd have to kind of slightly take a back seat in order to develop other artists because hmm. um, it, it is a, a challenging thing to have. Uh, we have about 11 or 12 staff now. Wow. And yeah. And uh, we're, 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 I think we're ambitious in the sense that we're really trying to do uh, I think a lot more and also our production values. Yeah, yep. our, our, we're trying to keep like high production values uh, with, with a rather tight knit team. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging, but everyone's, you know, really dedicated and, and it's, it's fun. And I, and I like producing with, and I, and I work with uh, a few other producers, you know, all in under this label and, um, it's exciting. I, I foresee a lot of interesting things happening if we can hang on for the next two or three years. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a fun challenge. And are you, um, are you reading anything these days? Uh, any Baha'i literature, spiritual literature that's, um, that's turning you on or inspiring you? You caught me there. That's actually one thing that I'm, I've been lacking of because, because of the very, very reason I've been doing a label and everything. Cause I'm, I've been uh, just too too preoccupied with trying to keep these uh, 11, 12 staff right. uh, fed. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the one thing that we have um, uh, occasionally managed to do is to do Ruhi. Uh, with, yeah. So that's happened a couple times when we can, when we can get everyone together. Um, and hopefully that will continue. In, in, uh, you know, so certain... you, are you saying you do Ruhi with your staff at Foo Music? Or... Uh, yeah. An yeah, artist, perhaps? Yeah. Uh, yes, actually, one of them has, but um, not with me. Actually, with some other Baha'i friends. Yeah, actually, with another friend. Yeah, the artist. Uh, this this artist has also taken Ruhi. Uh, I think book one. I think book two as well, or started on book two. Okay, great. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it's been it's been difficult because everyone's timing is so hectic and random, um, in you know, in this business. But yeah, we we managed to to do it a bit. I think we will we will have more coming, but. Uh, it will, it will be within the planning. Yeah, that's great. I've heard from people that um, people in China are very open to spiritual ideas because they haven't had spirituality in their lives for fifty, eighty, hundred years, um, mm -hmm. and they're open to the possibility of there being um, some spiritual solutions to the world's issues. And a lot of times, I know in the Western world in the United States, when you bring up that idea, some people are open to it, but a lot of people are like, "Oh no." Spirituality, i.e. religion, is the cause of these problems. That's not at all where I'm going to look for any kind of answer. But I've heard that that's kind of different in, in China. Would you find that to be true? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think my experience in China is that I mean, people are quite open to philosophy and, you know, spiritual ideas and philosophy are very much intertwined and mm -hmm. even in you know chinese history there it goes back to like confucius and Con confucius um taoism uh, you know, lots of many different philosophies and you know they all have i mean just like you know with, with other world religions they all have uh, principles that are you know similar or the same even at that so i think for the chinese i, I feel that they have been yeah very open to to these ideas spiritual ideas and and things that they see and uh, identify as, as positive change, positive, positive things that can move us forward. Mm, um, mm. So it's, yeah, they, I, I wouldn't even say just in spiritual matters. I think they're very much open in general to everything. I think they're, they're it's like, it's, it's, it's almost like they're a sponge at this time. And, right. And really, they're really keen to learn and to progress. Um, and, yeah, it's it's very it's it's very encouraging. I, mean, I see it as a very positive thing. Oh, well, that's exciting. Do you have any advice for young artists around the world who are trying to walk a spiritual path and at the same time break new ground artistically? I would say, well, I'd say perseverance is is you know one of the biggest factors. I think mm. um, a lot of times. Uh, I, 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 although one thing I would definitely say is, is you know, it's always great to be able to do something that you love as a career. And you know, some people are, aren't as lucky as some who, who do actually get to do it. So, 
but I would say every path, whatever it is, I think be open to, uh, you know, I because I, I get this question often. It's like, oh, what do, you, what do I want to do? What, what should I do if, if, you know, I want to be a singer? And the thing is, I used to think, oh, what could I say? Um, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, in my heart, it's, it's, I think that we should always not be attached to a result or, or a final mm. goal that we want to be accomplished. I mm. think it's always about really enjoying the journey yep. and, and really doing your best in everything um, at, at every moment. Try to do the best at that task that's at hand. Because if you, have, I, if you have that love of the craft, that will always guide you and sustain you. The love of making art and whatever it is and not looking for the results of that. And that's a, you know, that's a yeah. well-known, you know, Buddhist teaching is you can love the work and, and not be attached to the results of the work. Exactly. And even in, in the faith where we speak of detachment, that's, that's the, uh, that's the same concept and idea. And, and so for me, I think I just say be detached actually from the results and mm. just, you know, focus on the work and the message at hand. I think that is that's probably the the best I could I can do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Is there is there a piece of advice that you would have loved to have heard when you were just starting out and you were a teenager? Oh. What could you what would you like hmm. to say to your teenage self who was just launching his recording and performing career? If you the wise Khalil Fong of this of this day, what would you say to yourself back then? I'd say, I would say, I would say there's going to be three years or four years where you're going to sleep late because of work. Don't. Ah. <laughs> I mean, like, I'd say, yeah, it's, I, I, because I think there's a mis, I mean, you know, to each his own, but I, I really realized that I think there's a misconception about having to really stay up late and, and, and work, you know, and, and, and to uh, sacrifice your health. You know, for art, I don't think that, you know, I mean, I think if you don't have a choice, of course, there's, you know, people have to take care of the family or whatnot. I mean, I think, but I'd say that in, you know, taking all uh, into account, I think it's very important that we have to take care of our health in that sense. So I w- I'd probably say to myself and to other people out there that, you know, I think it's, it's important to have moderation and to uh, make sure you take care of your health as well. Ah, very good. Very yeah. good. <laughs> that's a more practical aspect. No, that's good. You're a very <laughs> practical guy. I love it. Um, so uh, so you, you're starting Foo Music, your own recording label. You're starting to produce other acts. Any other new projects you've got going? Yeah, actually, there's an exciting new project um, that a lot of people are going to be, especially my fans, are probably going to be surprised that um, it's, it, it'll be a bit unusual for me. But um, I have... See, my mother used to be in education uh, for, for many years, and she uh, had her own curriculum, um, and it was uh, teaching uh, principles and morals through English. Mm. And so she, she, yeah, she did that for a long time, and I had helped her with the cur- curriculum. I, I had provided the music for it. And uh, when I you know, got into the industry, um, I sort of took the lead as, you could say, the, the, the breadwinner then. And so we switched, sort of switched roles, and then she came and helped me with, with my music um, as far as, you know, the business side. And so I, I promised her that I would help her revisit um, her education project someday mm. when, when the time came, you know, and whatever form it may be, you know. Uh, and so recently I finally found within the last, well, not recently, it's actually been in the, uh, it's been in the makings for about three years now. Uh, but I finally got around to, to revisiting this and, it's basically a very fun project for children. Um, I can't say too much about it, but it's it's three years in the making, and I look forward to this because it's uh, it's going to be an exciting uh, way for children to, to you know um, I think learn about you know uh, a lot of Baha'i principles and universal principles, not yeah. just Baha'i principles. Yeah. And and yeah, it, it'll be. Because to me, when I was young, you know, I th- I think back in what affected me the most as a child. How did I get excited about things? You know, how did I, uh, what spoke to me? And so I, I, I want to recreate that kind of uh, an interest in this p- project that I'm doing. So oh, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wish you the very best with that. That sounds really exciting. 
And again, I, I, I love the way that you're, you're walking the walk as a, a young Baha'i artist who has the ability to influence millions and millions of fans. And uh, congratulations on all your great work. And thanks so much for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule to talk to us here at the Baha'i Blogcast. Well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure. Hope I get to meet you one day. Definitely. Okay. Maybe I'll you'll come and see you. <laughs> maybe you'll let me open if for you. If you're in Toronto. Maybe I'll, I'll, yeah. I can open for you on the road. Okay. With my okay. one-man uh, chorus line. What do you think? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's make that a, a plan. We'll plan on it. Thank you, Khalil <laughs> Fong. Thanks, Rain. Thanks for listening to Baha'i Blogcast. Hope you enjoyed the episode and the conversation. Check out more fun Baha'i stuff on Baha'iblog.net. Thank you so much, and good night.